Okay, I am Dr. Hillary Iskin. I am one of your GIM faculty. Uh, I work at the Belltown Clinic, and I am recently graduated from this residency program in June, so I know a lot of you. And I have with me today Dr. Will Simmons, one of our wonderful ID fellows, and he's agreed, he's graciously taken time out of his clinical schedule to be here with us today. So we'll pick his brain and then let him go free. <laughs> So this today's session is going to be a MixApp review. Probably most of you are familiar, but for those who are not, MixApp or the Medical Knowledge Self-Assessment Tool is a board prep tool that the R3s are hopefully becoming familiar with, but it's a question bank, not so different from UWorld, that we use to prep for the boards, and it's created by ACP, and you can buy it with your um, professional development funds. So what I've done today is I've gone through the infectious disease questions in the MixUp QBank, and I just high graded a few of them, the ones that I thought were the most interesting, the most relevant, or in some cases, the ones that the majority of mix app respondents got wrong so that we could talk talk them through. Um, just a few things before we start. Um, I'm hoping Kayla will be monitoring the chat for me. Although I will say at any point, feel free to just unmute and jump in. These sessions are, are better when they're interactive. And if my audio or video drops out, maybe Kayla will let me know. And then please forgive me in advance for any technological issues that come up through the session. Um, so the format is we will, I'll briefly show the questions stem on screen. Um, you should have already seen the questions, had a chance to talk through them in your breakout groups. And then Javel will launch a poll. We'll give you guys about a minute to put down, to put your nickel down on what you think the answer is. And I would encourage you, even if you're not sure, to just, to please go ahead and commit to something. I, I find that the learning is better if you have to force yourself to, to really be tested. And then we'll take a step back, we'll review the, the correct answer, and we'll talk a little bit about the background of the question. Any, any questions or concerns so far? Okay. All right, and I should mention neither of us has any disclosures or conflicts of interest. I suppose my only comment is that I'm a generalist, not an ID doc. Um, and our learning our learning goals here, we're gonna flip through several high yield ID topics, um, looking to pull out general principles where we can. And then also just to get you guys familiar with the question format. Okay, so we have our first question here. I'm not gonna reread it. Um, but I'll let you guys skim it. And then these are our answer choices. Let me know if anyone wants to go back to the stem again. Okay, so you guys predominantly chose answer choice B, 90% of you did. And you are right, and not only that, you do better than mix up, where only 45% of respondents got this question right. Um, does anyone who got the question right wanna talk us through why they chose this answer? Anyone in the Madison Clinic here? I, I can do it. I feel obligated to you in some <laughs> ways. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> um, so basically, the question is trying to get you to pick PEP with post-exposure prophylaxis. And um, PEP is basically Truvada plus an integrase inhibitor. And usually, we actually use dolutegravir. But um, for specifically occupational exposure, um, the studies that, like, uh, studied occupational exposure use raltegravir so that's like if you're doing like the data driven stuff um you start raltegravir and and tenofovir and emtricitabine that's both of those in combination are truvada um so that's what pep is um and and actually this is what 
folks will get started on the ED, and then they'll come to the Madison Clinic and get switched to Dolutegravir because Dolutegravir is BID, and that's no fun. Um, rather do it once daily. Amazing. And I, I, I thought like maybe for a second, like oh, if they're undetectable, like maybe we could like not put them on PEP, but. Um, actually, like U equals U isn't studied. Like we don't really know um, for bloodborne. Like U equals U specifically is for like sexual uh, exposure. So determining the source patient's viral load, while helpful information, and maybe could tell you that it's probably lower risk. Like it doesn't. You still would want to start PEP. Nice. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kevin. I'm so glad you're on Academic Half Day today. Um, can you can you share with the group what U equals U is for those who may not know. Yeah, U equals U is basically um, undetectable, means untransmissible, so you can't transmit your virus through sex. Um, it's based on like a study, well, multiple studies, um, but um, following 1600 uh, serodiscordant couples where one's HIV positive and one's HIV negative and as long as and, and they followed them over 10 years so it's like hundreds of thousands of sexual in, encounters theoretically and as long as the HIV positive partner was taking their meds and remained undetectable there was generally no transmission um, I say generally because there were some cases of transmission but they just um, there were issues with adherence and things like that so Amazing. You can feel awesome. very confident. That's great. And I also heard you say something about whether the exposure is occupational, which in this case it was, versus non-occupational. And I put just this little graph here showing that it's incredibly unlikely to uh, um, acquire HIV in the occupational setting. But maybe I'll maybe I'll turn things over to Will uh, to give us his thoughts on this. Yeah, totally agree. I agree with everything Kevin said. Um, this is a PEP question. So with all PEP questions, you're always thinking, you know, what's the risk from the source patient? And they almost always give you an unknown patient to make your life more difficult. What's the risk of the exposure? Um, which, uh, which is usually basically was there blood involved? You know, if, if a fluid is not visibly bloody or had blood on it, um, you, you generally don't care. So patients can throw their feces all they want. We're not giving people PEP. Um, and then, you know, the risk to the patient, which isn't, um, or with the kind of person who got stuck, which doesn't matter for HIV, but sometimes they'll give you a hepatitis B question. And then if the patient's got proven immunity with like a positive surface antibody, you don't need to prophylax them in any way. Um, and then once you kind of mash those three together, you decide whether the person needs post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and so I think, I don't really have that much to add. The Royal Tech Revere thing is in part the guidelines for non-occupational and occupational PEP are written by two different groups. The OPEP guidelines are older um, and so haven't kind of moved over to dull you, but probably will when they next update. Um, it's nice that it's once daily. Um, the other answers, just for, for those of you who chose them, uh, A is PrEP. So that's what you would put uh, someone on who is, you know, had, had pre-exposure, but is, you know, high risk. Um, for potentially acquiring HIV, and that's generally once daily. You can also do it in like a, a kind of just-in-time approach, but uh, I doubt they would test that one on the boards. Um, and then C is a reasonable regimen um, for uh, for HIV. Um, it's actually not first line anymore either, but we don't use it for PEP in part because tolerance is important with PEP, and that regimen will be less well tolerated, probably a little less effective too. Um, and then for the source patient's viral load, I think we've been discussing this in the chat, but um, but basically it's that, uh, that that takes time. You know, you ideally want to start PEP within 72 hours for HIV, within seven days for hepatitis B. Um, and so you, you don't want to wait for that. You should check their viral load. Um, you know, if, it, if the patient's available, most of the time they're not. But if it's zero, if they're totally undetectable, I think, you know, it's something where you could have a conversation with the patient and potentially consider stopping PEP. You know, I think if, if uh, a lot of AD doctors, if they were exposed and their viral load was undetectable, would probably stop PEP uh, on themselves. Um, that being said, people, there's a lot of kind of fear around HIV. Um, and so most patients, even if the risk is unbelievably low, will still continue PEP in, in my experience. 
Um, so it ends up not manage, mattering that much. It stratifies the risk of transmission. It's probably unbelievably to zero if the patient's viral load is undetectable, um, but we haven't proven that it's zero. And especially because, you know, there's kind of CD4 cells that come with the blood and those can have virus in them that's not detectable in a viral load, blah, 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 blah. You never get the virus out of the person's CD4 cells. There's a theoretical risk that isn't really as present with, uh, with non-occupational um, exposures. Um, and then I think we were looking at that slide for risk, um, with, uh, the, yeah, this one, the interesting thing with this is it's just how effective PEP is. I doubt they'll ask you, but, um, there's been no occupational transmissions of HIV in the past more than 20 years, except for that one in 2009, which wasn't, uh, a patient actually that was, or I think it was 2008 or 2009. That was a lab worker working with an HIV culture. Um, who got a needle stick in that setting and there was a transmission. Um, but no one has gotten HIV from a patient in more than 20 years who took PET. Um, and then, oh yeah, on the left here, kind of uh, buried a little bit, is uh, post uh, someone who's on PEP, they get tested when they start PEP to make sure they don't already have HIV. And then you test them at six weeks and four months. So the six weeks is two weeks after their PEP finishes and then four months later to make sure you're not missing like a delayed conversion. Or something like that, but I think that that's probably a little less likely to be tested. Um, yeah, I, th I think Kevin covered all of it. Amazing, and I just put at the bottom here the the National HIV Curriculum, which is where where I go is where I would go if something like this came up in clinic. Make sure I'm doing the right thing. Anybody with any other questions relating to this this first question? Oh yeah, and in real life, give everyone who's on PEP so friend. <laughs> Good to know. Good. All right, let's move forward then. Question two. This slide is full of text, but again, I, I'm hoping you guys already had a chance to review this. So I will flip to the answer choices. Nice. Okay, we got our poll results, and I, I don't know if you guys can see these, but 75% of you chose answer choice D, and that is the correct answer. And again, you guys are beating mix up by a pretty wide margin. Um, okay, and maybe again, I can ask anyone who chose the correct answer, you want to comment on why you chose that? Maybe somebody going into Palm Crit wants to talk to us about this one. The culture lies. Tell what do you mean by that, Mac? How can a culture lie? Well, the MICs for ESBL aren't always going to be um, interpretable in the same way that we interpret MICs or sensitivities in other organisms. Um, and then we were also reading that there are cases if you switch to, uh, you know cylinders or stuffless forms or things like that, there's increased rates of failure um, when you narrow. And so um, going to carbobenum-based therapy seemed to be the, the vibe. And you are right. And exactly like you I said, think... go ahead. I was going to say, I actually think Will taught me that when I was on ID consults last Amazing. year. Amazing. Full circle. All right. Um, Will, do you have anything else to add on this case? Yeah, I think it, it's this one's like the top line is if they they will probably tell you it's an ESBL, but if they say ESBL, the answer is always carbapenem um, in the book. Um, if you see ceftriaxone resistant, you should also really be thinking about a carbapenem. Um, I think this is probably the most testable of the drug resistance uh, things that they could give you. Um, 
as a clinical side, not for the test, if this patient was improving on Piptazo, I might actually leave them um, just because Piptazo gets great urinary concentrations, though since this patient was septic, maybe not. Um, and they are actually revising the Piptazo breakpoints to um, try to be a little more accurate. There's a, the debate on Piptazo for ESBLs is ongoing and acrimonious and don't ask Farrakh Fang about it. <laughs> um, basically there was a big randomized control trial um, yeah, chat GPT is wrong. Um, there was a big randomized control trial on this that was, uh, unfortunately, the micro lab for the randomized trial really screwed up the Piptazo breakpoints, um, really bringing into question the results of the whole trial. But the trial showed that Piptazo patients did worse, so we still run with that. Um, but the answer is carbapenem, either Irda, Irda or Miro is fine if you see ASBL. Um, so I don't think Piptazo or Cefepime would be a correct answer here. If it was an enterobacter, so suggesting more an AMP-C-based mechanism, then Cefepime could be a reasonable choice if it tested susceptible. Uh, but this is not one of those. This is an E. coli, and they tell you it's ESBL, so just carbapenem every time. Um, also fine to remember, other thing to remember is that, you know, non-beta lactams are fine. So like if this patient was ready to go and they were back from susceptible, you know, that would be a totally reasonable step down therapy. Um, it's okay to step down to things, just not to things that are, you know, non-carbapenem beta lactams. Um, yeah, I think ESBL is probably the, by far the most testable thing for drug resistance. Me, I think AMPC is probably difficult to test, especially since those were, got revised about two years ago. I feel like it takes three or four years for new things to show up on the boards. Uh, but remember Enterobacter and Klebs orogenes, X Enterobacter orogenes are the two big AMPC players. Um, yeah, any other questions about this? I would not add JET for Synergy. Um, yeah. I think this is a, a pretty, unfortunately, a remember, ceftriaxone resistant equals ESBL equals miropenem. Nice. All right. Awesome. Okay. We're going to keep moving forward here. I had to include a tuberculosis question because it's ID. And going to flip forward here to the question stem. Okay, and 84% of you chose answer B, and you are right. Um, this is, he's going to get daily isoniazid for nine months. Does anyone want to share with us, what are, what are we treating with this? Um, I can share. Uh, we are treating latent TB here because they had a positive pantoferone, but their x-ray did not show any nodule active TB. They don't have any symptoms of active TB or like other non-pulmonary TB. Um, we talked about that the guidelines has just very recently changed uh, to, I think, moving rifampin as a first line, but uh, we thought that the board would not reflect it yet. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but we still like to treat latent uh, TB and this is the duration. I had a lot of patients who don't tolerate the isoniazide and I think this is part of why they changed the guidelines. Um, um, yeah. Amazing, thank you so much, Aya. Yeah. And you are absolutely right. We're treating latent TB here. They don't have any signs or symptoms of TB on history. And like you said, exam and chest radiograph don't show any signs of active TB. Um, 
maybe I'll turn it over to Will. I, I just put a diagram with the regimens here. Yeah, so I agree this is latent TB. For those of you who are paying a lot of attention, some jerks decided to rename all of this. So it's now tuberculosis infection is latent TB and tuberculosis disease is active TB, which I hate. Um, I hate it when people rename things that I've gotten used to, um, but I'm sure they'll probably still be calling it latent TB on the boards. Um, I agree, isoniazid is a reasonable regimen. Um, anyone know what you should be giving the patient in addition to isoniazid if you're giving them isoniazid? B6. Yeah, there we go, pyridoxine. I think it's a little weird that they didn't include it in the answer choice, but good, everyone's all over that. Um, the other options, the 3-HP or isoniazid and rifapentine is actually a regimen. They just uh, gave it to you for the wrong duration. They gave you 24 weeks instead of 12. Uh, but if that was 12 weeks, that would actually be a totally reasonable regimen um, that is nice as DOT uh, for patients who can't keep track of pills. Um, the third option is full dose treatment, which this patient does not need. Um, and then uh, no treatment or testing, you know, not unreasonable. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but probably not what you would choose on, uh, your boards. Um, like, like, uh, you mentioned four months of rifampin is probably the most common choice. Um, uh, it's daily rifampin for four months. Um, it works just as well, if not better than isonized, it has better adherence, often has fewer side effects, um, uh, probably less toxicity. All of these regiments, the toxicity is liver toxicity. Um, but you don't monitor LFTs unless someone has baseline liver function abnormalities. You just counsel them on, you know, call us if you turn yellow. Um, what else is good to know about latent TB? I think that's it. Um, oh, rifampin. The main reason we don't put that in is, is, is uh, the main reason someone ends up not on rifampin is usually the drug interactions. You know, they're on a, a anticoagulation or something else that you really can't, immunosuppression, something you can't safely adjust. Um, and so that's why, like in the transplant world, they all get isoniazid, at least until they have a new liver. Um, and even then, um, I guess the, the main confusing thing with LTB is, uh, is who you test, because everyone you test, you, sh you shouldn't test someone if you're not going to treat them, right? And so the groups that you should test for latent tuberculosis, I think of them in like two big buckets, is people who are at... Um, high risk for reactivation, and then people who, um, something really bad would happen if they reactivated. Um, and so, you know, in terms of higher risk for reactivation, obviously all your immunosuppressed people, and then people with recently acquired TB. So your risk of TB is the highest in kind of the two to five years after, or activating, reactivating is highest in the two to five years after infection. So P, this is why we test people who are, you know, recent immigrants from an endemic area, people who've recently spent time in kind of shelters, jails, other areas, or with close contacts of uh, active TB cases is because this initial period is higher risk. Um, and then, you know, your immunosuppressed people, bad things will happen if they reactivate. So oncology patients, transplant patients, patients with HIV, uh, TNF alpha inhibitors, kind of all those groups, smokers. Um, and then the last group that is weird for the U.S. that is, I don't think, testable on the boards, but just good to know, is the U.S. tests everyone from an endemic area in the guidelines, even if they're more than five years out. I think, you know, I th many people think this is a stupid approach. If you, you know, immigrated from an endemic area 30 years ago and you have a positive T-spot, like your odds of reactivating TB are probably no greater than, you know, someone who acquired it as a child who's not from the endemic area, like being from the endemic area itself doesn't increase your risk. Um, and so I often, you really consider whether you need to test those patients, um, but the US guidelines recommend that everyone from an endemic area be test screened and treated if, you know, if positive. Uh, a lot of other countries will stop screening them once they're more than like five years out from immigration. Um, not testable, but just for general medicine purposes. Uh, John asks, do I suggest using the uh, those tools? I think those tools are great. Um, they're a nice way to kind of put in front of the patient. It's, I think they're helpful when you've got uh, a, you know, a quant or a skin test that shouldn't have been done. Um, and then you're like, do you really want to go through with this? Because I think they're a nice way to kind of 
show the patients the risks of complications from the medications as compared to the risk of developing TB. Because in some patients, it's really just not worth it. Um, and they should just, you know, watch for active symptoms of TB. So I think they're helpful in those cases. You know, ideally, if you sent the test, you should have, you know, been planning to treat them if you got the test back because they were high risk. But we see tons of these where people send tests that shouldn't have been sent. And then I think it's a super helpful tool. I think it's a great tool. Um, what else about latent TB? Um, the only other thing I guess that's worth remembering is uh, I don't wouldn't memorize them, but remember for skin tests, which I think are probably less and less likely to get tested on as time goes by, the size of induration, the indurated area is the part that makes it positive and how big the induration needs to be to count as positive gets smaller, the higher risk you are. So someone with, you know, active HIV, is, you know, five millimeters will turn them positive. Whereas someone who has no risk factors and is not high risk, 15 millimeters will turn them positive. So it's a little weird, but you need like smaller. It's the, they try to make the test essentially more sensitive um, for people who are higher risk. Um, so you can have a relatively small amount of induration, like six millimeters is positive in someone who's high risk. Whereas, you know, in a healthcare worker with no medical problems wouldn't be a positive test. Uh, but I wouldn't memorize that, but just be aware of that. Um, yeah, other questions about uh, latent TB? I think uh, I would get a chest X-ray in everyone before you treat them. And uh, yeah, TB lymphadenitis, as hinted at here, is the most common extrapulmonary manifestation of active TB. Um, looks like we got a follow-up question on ceftriaxone resistance to ESBL. Uh, yes, in most situations, um, for gram negatives that aren't AMP-C producers, basically. Um, in AMP-C producers, which includes pseudomonas, it's a more complicated question. Um, but for non-AMP-C, so not enterovactor clubs or pseudomonas, I assume I'm dealing with an SBL until really proven otherwise when I see septraxin resistance. All right. That's all I got. Amazing. All right, I'm gonna bring us here to question four. And we'll flip over to the answers. Just let me know if you wanna go back to this question stem. Sorry, Will, just wanted to ask a quick question about the last question before we went on. Do we need to do any retesting for the patient after we treat them for a complete course? Okay. No, um, there's there's no point. The tests are like, like a syphilis antibody or an immunologic test. They're going to stay positive forever. Some patients do revert their quantifuron, um, but that's not well studied in any kind of useful way to be like, oh, this was successful versus not. We just assume if they took all their pills, they're successfully treated, knowing that all of these regimens don't have a hundred percent success rate. You know, they're depending on who you ask and how good the adherence was 70 to 90 something percent. Um, so if the only thing you would do is, you know, if the person has symptoms concerning for active TB after treatment for latent TB, knowing that it's totally possible and you would work them up for active TB but you would, there's no reason to repeat a quantifier or a skin test once someone has had adequate treatment for latent TB. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, so let's say we treat the latent TB and then the patient had another exposure and we're worried about them having latent TB. Again, is there a test that we could do now? Because that one's nope. always going to be positive? You got to decide whether to retreat them. I see. Um, so sometimes we will. So like, uh, especially in patients who are high risk, say someone who got treated for LTBI as a child, you know, had a positive, you know, skin test or quant then, and then their partner, you know, 20 years later, their partner got active TB um, and they were living with them for like five months before the diagnosis. Um, we'll empirically treat those patients, um, but there's no test that's useful. I mean, if you know the person's quant reverted, um, which is uncommon because one, you should never have tested that. And then it turns positive again, like that would be helpful, but we don't test. So I, I wouldn't do that. You would just kind of based on your a clinical assessment of the risk, decide whether to empirically retreat them. And in that case, um, is there any evidence or data demonstrating that you can use the same treatment you used the first time, or if you should try an alternate first line treatment for latent TB? Same treatment's fine. The idea being that this is a different TB that they've acquired. Right, so it's it's not like this one they had before has kind of recaused latent TB, and you know 
there's a concern for drug resistance because they're exposed. Um, it's the idea is they were re-exposed to a different strain of TB, which has no reason to be any more drug resistance resistant than any other, you know, TB. Um, if someone had latent TB, got treated, and they got active TB after that, like you'd be a little worried about drug resistance, maybe. Um, but that's part of why RIPE has four drugs when you start out, is to give you time to try to find out if there's drug resistance. So no, I would treat with whatever regimen was best for the patient the second time around too. Thank you. Awesome questions. Are you guys still working on the poll for question four? Oh, here we go. All right, and you guys, most of you chose answer choice A at 71%, 21, 24% did choose answer choice B. Um, and those of you who chose A are right. And again, you're you're beating mix up, so great job. Um, let's see. And most of you avoided kind of the trap of the the, the lower down answer choices. Um, does anyone want to talk us through why they chose that answer? Because the kind of cannons were listed listed first on up to date before Azals. <laughs> Mac, you can't use up to date on the boards. <laughs> That's how real practice is. <laughs> right on both counts. <laughs> um, and the, the main teaching point here is that Candida in a blood culture is not a contaminant. Um, well, maybe I'll maybe I'll invite you in here. Never, ever, 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 ever a contaminant. Um, but yeah, it, it's a Stop being glib. Um, the kind of candidates are the correct choice um, for, I think, a couple reasons, actually. Um, one is like, as mentioned on this slide, some candidate species are intrinsically azole resistant. Um, and so you want to hedge against those. And there's uh, a lot less resistance to mica fungin. It's extremely rare. Um, and so I think mica is the best choice. Um, and then for that reason, but then I also actually would choose it, even if you knew it was um, like albicans, which is generally and eminently fluke susceptible, you should still choose uh, mycofungin as your empiric therapy. Um, just because one, you want to make sure you get senses. Two, the least I, the reason I do it, and this is way too in the weeds, so turn off your brains if you're just sure. looking for mix app. But in uh, candida endocarditis, even in fluke susceptible isolates, the patients do better if they get mica up front and then step down to fluke rather than going straight to fluke. Even if the isolate was fluke susceptible the whole time, I think mica is just probably a little bit better at, at murdering the, uh, the candida up front for some reason. Um, and so I choose mica up front and then step the patient down. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, it's totally fine to step down to an azole when it's susceptible. I agree with looking for candida in people's eyes if they've had any kind of significant candidemia. Optos against this um, because they did a review that it was rare. Um, and then someone else did a review that they were like less than 0.9% of candidemia has eye involvement. And then ID did a review where I found it was a bit higher, like two or 3%, which is high enough that I kind of think about it more. Um, so, I, I, you know, if they ask you if someone should get an eye exam, if someone had candidemia and they have anything suggesting vision changes or significant candidemia or endocarditis with candida, um, an eye exam is probably not a wrong answer. Uh, let's see, is this the candida oris thing? <laughs> yeah, CDCs. Yeah, candida oris has been blowing up. Uh, Nevada has been having an insane outbreak for, uh, gosh, must be four or six months now. It's kind of flown under the radar. Um, and then, uh, and we're just waiting for it to show up in Washington state. Uh, how do you murder candida oris? Often mycofungin. Um, candida oris tends to be mycofungin susceptible. Uh, it can develop resistance, but, uh, but mica is still not the wrong choice up front. Um, but you're going to want susceptibility testing. Yeah. Mica equals murder. <laughs> it has like no side effects. It's like the best drug. Turn up the dose as high as you want. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> I've given someone more than 300 of mycofungin. They were fine. They were not fine, but they tolerated the drug. Okay. Uh, other questions about Canada and candidemia? Remove all lines with Canada. 
Um, it is not one you can treat through the line. I don't think that they would. Uh, I don't think they would test you. You'd have to write a question about. It. Um. Yeah. So I think all I got on Canada. Okay. Anybody else got a question? Yeah, chat. Chat's gone off the rails. I'm I'm intentionally ignoring it. I can see the red flashing numbers. Ugh, I can't get distracted. All right. Okay. Question five. Um, you guys saw this one already. Here we go over to the question answers. Okay. All right. We've got our poll results in and 61% of you chose answer choice A and we're pretty evenly split through the rest. Um, this was a trick question, sort of. Um, the answer here is gentamicin. Someone, one, one of the lucky few or one, one of the few who knew answer, that this answer was gentamicin. Would you, be, would you talk to us about why you chose that? Or maybe what you talked about in your breakout groups about this question. One of the things that came up for us was that this is some weird outbreak at a political rally. That's like maybe some terrorist like bug, like bacillus and racist, or like one of us also thought it was like maybe Yersinia or whatever. Like, I don't know. There was some weird stuff going on um, with bioterrorism. So we were split between either D, C or D, um, but we don't really totally know what the organism is. Nice. Thanks so much, Kevin. And whoever thought it was Yersinia is right. Um Mixup loves to ask these bioterrorism questions. Um, and if you're right, it also, this wasn't anthrax in this case, but they, they do also like to ask about that. You're going to treat that with, with the antibiotics listed here. But for plague, you actually want to use gentamicin. Um, will, will you teach us a little bit about that? No. <laughs> no I mean, it's like uh, those bioterrorism questions. I hate them. Um, so, uh, Technically, probably all of these answers are wrong um, because if it's bioterrorism, the CDC actually recommends you use two active agents for concern for engineered drug resistance, that the terrorists are very good and have engineered resistance into their uh, mnemonic plague. So yeah. technically, you'd use GENT plus another agent, um, often equivalent. But uh, GENT is the correct answer here because that's the go-to use for non-drug uh, for non-bioterrorism um, plague. Uh, I think there was a plague case in the MICU at UW uh, last year. Women's cats all died. Unfortunately, the OSH made the diagnosis already. Sorry, everyone. But um, yeah, there's a couple bioterrorism things that they can ask you about. The gram-negative coxobacilli is, or they're often more gram-negative cocci, but they can also give you coxobacilli is what makes it plague. If it was tularemia, it would be a full-on gram-negative rod. Tularemia is also gent, so if you thought 
if it was tularemia, you still would have picked gent. Um, if the patient's really sick, which this one is, otherwise quinolones are fine. Um, I guess we can rattle off the, the plague agent. So Yersinia pestis, this one is either pneumonic or bubonic plague. Bubonics are like big buboes. They're like essentially look like a massive lymph node. They appear in areas where there are lymph nodes. Um, and gent is the correct answer uh, for plague. Uh, Cipro is prophy if someone has plague. Um, tularemia is more commonly, you know, animal or tick exposure, but can be a bioterrorism agent. They tend to have more diffuse infiltrates and hyalur adenopathy, uh, but they'd have to give you more clues. That's a gram-negative rod. Oh, the coughing up, the bloody sputum is classic for uh, Yersinia or for pneumonic plague. Um, so that was one of the clues in the question stem. Um, other ones, uh, anthrax. Um, uh, is I think the main thing with anthrax is it's not transmissible person to person. Um, so there's no prophylaxis needed. I feel like sometimes that gets asked for some reason where the, the other ones do need prophylaxis or plague does need prophylaxis. Anthrax, remember, can have the cutaneous SR or the widened mediastinum is the test question. Um, anthrax gets treated with like three or four drugs, so they will not ask you about treatment. Smallpox, looks like smallpox. I don't think tecumvirumab would be on the test, but vaccinate everyone within a million miles if there's an exposure. Uh, and then uh, what else? I think those are the big ones. Oh, botulism, just antitox, descending paralysis. Um, you don't treat the bacteria. But yeah, these bioterrorism questions, I'm not sure I would spend a lot of time on them, but they all, they're all they always there. I feel like every board review I've had, been at, gone through, there's been these questions and then there's always some like weird exposure bioterms yeah. i don't know if it became mandatory after september 11th or something <laughs> but uh this is pneumonic plague treat with gent tularemia also treat with gent quinolones are not a bad answer for most other things yeah and in the non-bioterrorism setting i think sometimes we forget that our whammy regions may may have high, more cases of these and like will said that patient there was a patient at uw last year who got pneumonic plague at her home in the one of the whammy states and then was transferred to our ICU for care. So it does come up again. It was not a bioterrorism case, but I'll see it again. Died. Yeah. Um anybody else any questions on this? That was basically everything I know about these. So if you have more questions. <laughs> How many I'm cats did she have? She had a lot of cats from what I heard. Not enough. <laughs> oh, Mac. <laughs> Never enough. All right. I got another question for you here. Um, all right. Kevin is readying his knowledge, their knowledge. Okay. Okay. All right. We're kind of split here. 55% said answer choice A. 42% said answer choice D. Reassuringly, none of you wanted to stop ART. Thank you for that. Okay. And you guys were, you guys were right here. We're going to continue this person on their current treatment. Um, let's see. Maybe, Will, any other thoughts here? Yeah, I think nowadays this has gotten a lot easier. Almost never change someone's ART when they become pregnant. Um, there there used to be some regimens that were a hard change. There still are some regimens that are a hard change, their ART, uh, but they're drugs that like no one is on anymore. Um, so, so don't. 
So you should almost never be changing someone's ART in pregnancy. Um, Cobacystat boosted regimens are the most common bugaboo because their levels become much less reliable. Then it's like a, you know, discuss with patient, um, you know, whether they want to take that risk and watch them closely or change them to a non Cobacystat boosted regimen. Um, but everything else, it's like almost always keep them on their current regimen if they're, if they're suppressed. If they're not suppressed, please try to suppress them. Um, but, uh, but if they're suppressed, just leave them alone. Um, there, I could feel like a couple of years ago, there was a big worry about dolutegravir neural tube defects that has since been proven to have been fake news. So dolutegravir is fine if they test you on that. Um, but I think that, and never stop someone's ART, uh, <laughs> agree. Um, if the, uh, the, I guess the only other thing, which you won't get tested on, the zidovudine rings your rings a bell with pregnancy for those of you who chose that one, because that's what we use for perinatal transmission prevention. Um, if the mother's viral load is more than a thousand, I think, um, at delivery, uh, this patient is suppressed. So we probably wouldn't do that if they stayed suppressed. Um, but also we don't use that as their primary HIV regimen. Um, yeah, I think basically the risk benefit is all, almost always in favor of keeping them on their current drugs because preventing HIV transmission to the child is, or to the baby is the most important thing. Uh, and the risks of most ART is relatively low um, in pregnancy. So don't change people's regimens unless they're failing them is generally the answer in pregnancy. Mixstaff includes a lot of questions on pregnancy. Um, so that's, that's, that's part of why I threw this one in too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I think that is our last question here. So I've, I've summarized a few of our learning points. Um, again, carbapenems for ESBL producing organisms. Canada is not a contaminant. Uh, expect expect uh, mix up to throw bioterrorism questions at you. And please don't take someone off ART. <laughs> Um, maybe we'll just, I'll just open up the floor a little bit for questions about these things, more general, pick your brain ID questions, if, if Will's up for it, if we have a little bit of time left. So far away, guys. Everyone's in the chat. Nobody, nobody's talking out loud. Um, I, I, uh, I started typing things in response to Max's question. Um, the in all seriousness, the board um, there is an R three board review day f uh, at the end of the year for all of you. Hillary can speak to it because she recently went through it and hopefully it was good preparation. That is one of the topics covered. The board pass rate it is higher than the sixty six percent that Roxanne put in there. Um, I don't have the latest numbers, but it is actually much higher than that. And uh, traditionally, we, we we do very, very well. We have anywhere between zero to uh, one year. We had two people who didn't pass it on the first attempt. And the ITE score often correlates with risk for not passing on first attempt. So if you are in a lower score range, please be in communications with your um, mentor, your APD. Yeah, and guys, I intentionally chose questions to try to stump you. There are a lot of other ones that you're going to know right away. So don't let this session make you feel like you're going to fail. And I also will say, uh, mix-up questions are harder than board questions. Board questions, because they're such high stakes, are written to be much more uh, straightforward. And um, there, there aren't these tricky, like, A and B are correct, but you have to do A first and B slightly later and that sort of thing. None of that's in there because it's so high stakes. Though I will say, if you want to let a little bit of panic um, from this session compel you to start studying, it's not a bad time now. If you're if you're graduating this year, it's not a bad time to buy your Q bank and start doing a couple questions a day just to get a little familiarity. All right. Anybody have any more any more ID questions? We can.
I just wanted to clarify. I know the pass rate is like in the 90s, but the I, I thought the number of questions you need to get correct is like 65 to 70 percent or something. Something like that. What is our program's pass rate, I wonder? I think I, it, it sent, from what John said, it sounds like it's like very, very high. There's been like a couple years where there's like maybe one or two. It, I, I, guys, we're going to be fine. Hillary, I was asking that question literally to like stress management, like am I like my studying like appropriately? Not like this is not step one. I'm not, I'm not worried. I don't think, yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Sorry, Will, I don't have any like good ID questions. I, do you want to talk about cerebral malaria? No. Yeah, maybe. No. <laughs> hey, the good thing about cerebral malaria is it may not get me called in overnight anymore. Wait, what? Tell me what? So we, have... we used to, yeah, if people have questions that are more germane to either medical practice or uh, the <laughs> boards, feel free to ask them before this uh, or just interrupt. Um, yeah, we don't need to carry your meds from CTAC anymore. Basically, so the, for those of you who want ID fun facts, IVR tesinate, which is the treatment for cerebral malaria, was not approved in the U.S. because the C FDA requires you to have U.S. trials and no one ever did a U.S. trial, though it's the standard of care in the rest of the world and WHO recommendation. Yeah. So the CDC had a stash that you could use as stored at the quarantine station, CTAC being the nearest one, that you could basically get this technically non-approved drug for like research purposes um, for patients with cerebral malaria. The FDA recently decided, and CDC decided they were sick of this approach and approved the drug a couple years ago now. Um, oh, so and so basically have phased out the quarantine stations. And as of sometime last year, you can no longer get it from SeaTac, and it's now available through a commercial drug company. The problem is that company is based in like North Carolina. Um, and this drug costs a ton of money. So a lot of hospitals don't have an incentive to keep it on for, on formulary to keep doses in house because they expire within, you know, not a tiny amount of time, but they expire and you could not have a cerebral malaria case in that time. And cerebral malaria is an emergency. And so getting something flown from North Carolina is a pain in the neck. Um, and it's super expensive to keep. UW has decided to keep um, basically a, a course on, uh, on formulary. So we now have it in house. Um, and, uh, and basically, and we share it between Harborview, UW and children. I forget, I forget where we keep it. Was that, um, was that like changed or like, was that decision made after? Cause I had, I mean, yeah, I had a picture since, that, since that, that case. Yeah. yeah it's since relatively new. Okay. It's since okay. that case, we just approved it at TNT, uh, like a, a couple months ago, maybe. Oh, right. I, um, I also feel like but basically CDC like didn't want to deal with it and now it's going to cost us a ton of money. Um, but Great. the reason ID had to come in was because we had to look at the smear and talk to the CDC and say, this is cerebral malaria, please give us your drug. And yeah. now theoretically, you'll just be able to order it. It's probably ID approval still, but mm -hmm. ID, it's the, that was the one thing that got an ID fellow in overnight generally. Um, <laughs> there was always like every year there was one person who got brought in, uh, that's funny. but maybe not anymore. Sorry. Well, that's great. We'll have you to, we'll have you to spend money on that as opposed to paying us more. Yeah. And with that, it's not that much money. We just like to avoid spending money. Oh. Will, thank you so much for joining us today, for taking time out of your busy clinical schedule. Um, this, was, this was, I think, a... <laughs> Guys, ID has many downsides, but second year is great. <laughs> um, thank you also to Dr. Iskin for taking time out of her busy clinical schedule, because I know you're going to go right back and see patients. Um, it's true. I think with that, if folks have other questions and want to stick around and ask them for a couple more minutes, feel free. But I think we're otherwise done for the day and y'all get sort of an hour or some extra wellness time here this morning. Hillary, do you have to go right back or can I ask you a question? You can ask me a question until 1030 and then I have to go back. Okay. So, I can so hang around for a couple minutes. Um, well, well, the the quick question is um, whether you're having fun and enjoying this. Yeah, it is fun. Okay. Yeah. 